I am Dr. John Flett Brown, a local Orkney geologist. Today I'm going to bring you on a virtual geological trip around the shore at the south end of the town of Strumness in the Orkney Islands. The oldest rocks in this area consist of granite and granite gneiss which formed in the root zone of the Caledonian mountain chain about one billion years ago. These rocks eventually came to the surface around 460 million years ago during the Ordovician mountain building episode. This granite gneiss complex, shown in red on the geological sketch map of Strumness area, forms an inselberg or island in the Lake Orkady Lacustrian Basin. The word inselberg comes from the German language for island mountain, which clearly describes the Strumness Island in Lake Orkady. At the point of Ness we observe three ninety million year old beach deposit. At this point, Lake Orkady forms a vast complex of lake deposits stretching from the Murray Firth across to western Norway and north to east Greenland. This formed during the Devonian, which started here in Orkney around 390 million years ago. It lasted for approximately 15 million years. This beach deposit is clearly observed on the west shore of Stromnes. We are here now at the end of the Golf Club Road uh, at Ness and standing at the toe of the Inselberg that goes from uh, Yesnaby through Brinkies Bray down to here and across to Grimsey. The rocks here consist in front of me solimanite bearing schists indicative of fairly hot and deep burial of these rocks in the Caledonian mountain chain. We have granites over behind me coming through. These granites consist of aplites and pegmatites and to the west here we have the edge of Lake Orkady, the beach that goes on top of the granite gneiss complex and into the flagstones of Lake Orkady. Here we have a large congregation of pebbles and boulders making up the beach deposits on the edge of Lake Orkady. We can see very large rounded boulders, pebbles and cobbles and in between the cobbles we have a sandstone. This is typical of a beach deposit, similar to what we see in the present day beach around this area where we have hollows and that hollow is filled up with present day cobbles and sand. Okay, we have just uh, travelled up section from the contact between the uh, lake water and the granite gneiss complex from rounded boulders of the beach complex up into the cliff here of much more angular rock uh, which is the point at which we start calling this the basal breccia of the Strumnus granite gneiss complex.
I am sitting here on top of the Basel Breccia where the waters of Lake Orkady have continued to uh, create beach type deposits with much smaller rounded pebbles before we go up into the flagstones. These flagstones probably have some stream action and we can see the ripple marks in the cliff face here showing that the direction of water flow is off the Inselberg and flowing to the west. What we're looking at here is a storm beach. This is one of three storm beaches that we find in this lower section of the uh, lacustrian sediments. We can see individual blocks and they're all angular. If were, this was a beach with constant wave action then they'd be much more rounded. So this is probably formed in a single event with a wave climbing up the beach and gathering up material, carrying it across and out to the lake floor. Absolutely no real erosion of the material. There's some indication elsewhere uh, in the sediments here that this may be a tsunami caused by movement uh, on some of the faults we see. Lakes tend to respond to minor changes in sediment and water balance driven by climatic, tectonic and geomorphic processes. This unique behaviour of certain basins can provide high resolution record of climate within the continental setting. Lake Orkady is dominated by an aggregation of repetitive sedimentary facies recording distinct lacustrian expansion and contraction. These cycles consist of facies associations of littoral, nearshore and deep water environment. These cycles comprise facies that may never have been simultaneously deposited in the basin. These cycles are termed non waltherian and do not really equate to any established sequence stratigraphic unit. This makes it difficult to trace the cycles across the basin. We are now about four or five metres above the top of the breccia. We've come through much more sandy and silty sediments and I'm sitting here on flagstones that are themselves very silty. This then passes up into a laminite, finely varved uh, sediment about one and a half meters thick. This is lake sediment one and there's no fish in this sediment but it is very anoxic in its characteristics. Dark, thinly varved. These varves are annual layering within the laminite in the relatively deep water of the lake. And each varve is on the order of 160 microns thick. That is every year 0.16 of a millimetre is deposited. We can see here 
that I have managed to uh, break off about a millimetre's worth of uh, rock and we can also find that it actually is not the actual thickness of each of the barbs. Every five millimetres or every five barbs we have a thicker barb which gives us this type of banding but the real annual banding is much thinner in here with about five or six barbs between these two sizes. So this I think is part of the El Nino type of climatic features that we see all over the Arcadian Lake. We're now about three metres above the top of Lake One, the, the large one and a half metre lake. And at the base of this lake we have stromatolites and we find layers of stromatolite debris going across here. The small fault is dropping down from uh, the stromatolite layer above my head. In this fault we have a fault gouge made up of fairly dense, heavy piece of material and Matthew Foster Heddle, who was one of Scotland's foremost mineralogists and an Arcadian by birth, named this stromnesite. This is Galena which is forming in the centre of this uh, vein complex and it's a mineral that's mainly lead and silver and zinc in this area. It also adds to the density of the material. We're here now on the eastern side of the fault plain and this is the start of near lake number two. We're about maybe four meters above lake one and we can see a breccia made up of stromatolite pieces and then we go up into a regularly deepening and shallowing flagstone sequence. The dark colours are laminites or fish bed and the light colours are deeper water conditions. So this is termed a near lake. It's right on the margin of the lake. The flagstone sequences of the Middle Devonian in Orkney are cycles which are defined as the uh, sediments in between one lake laminite deposit to the next lake laminite deposit. We are standing here where I am on top of near lake 2 which is the uh, lake that was the alternately shallow and deeper. Then we come into the top of the lake at my feet here and we go up through silt stones into slightly ripple marked sand then up into a mud flat. This mud flat is highly desiccated meaning that there's lots of large and small mud cracks. Then we go up into a sand flat and at the very top we have 
lake number three. So between my feet here and the top of the cliff, we have one cycle, which is estimated to be a Milankovitch 100,000 year cycle. This is the drying out mud flat and within this mud flat we have periods of desiccation which creates mud cracks. Some very large like this one here which goes down through many beds and then gets infilled with silt. These mud cracks extend for some distance apart and they create very large pseudo-hexagonal structures in planar section. Above this we have lots more very small mud cracks which are infilled and these make smaller hexagonal mud cracks in planar section. We can see here the mud cracks in three dimensions, the planar pseudo-hexagonal shape here with the vertical cracks at going down the side of the rock. Stromatolites are probably one of the most primitive life forms found on Earth. The earliest stromatolites exist in the Precambrian of Australia and are about 2 billion years old. However, also stromatolites are found in the present day of Sharks Bay. They are also observed in the Devonian along the Stromness shore. These stromatolites of sedimentary structures formed by cyanobacteria, a blue-green algae, together with other bacteria and algae. Stromatolites are common in the Orcadian Lake and can be recognised by their laminated structure built up layer by layer through the sediment, binding and carbonate secretion activity of the cyanobacteria. These structures are often flat algal mats, but also form columns and hemispherical mounds. The columnar structures are like fingers sticking out from the sediment in Orkney. These are called horsetooth stone. The mounds are easy to recognise when they're weathered on the foreshore. Most probably these structures were affected by grazing organisms such as fish living in the lake and from studies of recent cyanobacteria it's clear that these structures exist in extremely hostile conditions, such as when the Arcadian Lake was nearly dry, having become hypersaline. The stromatolites were the last to disappear. I am sitting here on the base of lake number three, and this lake at this point is lacking any fish remains due to the possible hypersalinity of the lake in this area at this particular point in time. We say that because uh, this section is full of stromatolite and the stromatolites 
go from just normal planar stromatolites that we see as the dolomitic layers here going up into thicker and thicker stromatolites until we come to the Christmas tree stromatolite above my head here. This stromatolite has grown out over a core of the uh, laminite and the muds have washed out. We can see thin layering of the stromatolite under these mounds. These mounds we can find all along the shore here. This being lake number three, lake number four and lake number five are all intermixed with large and smaller stromatolite mounds. What we have in front of me here is another different shape or structure of stromatolite mound. It is elongate towards the camera. It's about three times long to one wide. Within here, the structure of this stromatolite growth where it grows like the horsetooth stone, covering a core of sandstone through time. I am now standing on the top of Lake 4 and the base of Lake 5. Lake 5 covers this and Lake 5 has another set of large stromatolite mounds. You can see here stromatolite mound. The actual mound is about three quarters of a meter in height but the actual stromatolite thickness is only 10 to 15 centimeters. The stromatolites grow over the top of the original siltstone and protects the siltstone and grows in height. We can see the stromatolite structures and we can note how they thin as it goes down. So this is the edge and along the edge of the, the mound we have a runnel and at my hand here, we have stromatolite breccia. This breccia is about 10 centimeters thick and goes all the way along. Above this mound, we can see a good example of differential compaction in the overlying sediments. I am standing here on the, at the base of Lake Six where the sediments, the flagstone sediments below here have current directions coming from the northwest. Above we get much kosher sands and grits where there's very obvious current directions coming from the west. At this point, the Brinkisbrae Inselberg is covered. It no longer exists as a topographic feature in Lake Orkady, and we have a complete change in the sedimentary regime with rivers flowing with lots of sediment from the west. We can see here gypsum pseudomorphs. This is the earliest indication 
of gypsum pseudomorph formation in the Arcadian Basin. Six or seven Milankovitch cycles above the base of the Eiffelian. Ever after this we see these gypsum pseudomorphs forming above and below the laminite. We are now just above uh, lake bed 7 and we have a, a change in the style of stromatolite from the previous part of the section. We can see stromatolite mounds, miniature mounds, all the layers of dolomite are stromatolite beds. We never see again in this whole section any large stromatolite mounds like we saw previously. We are also at this point starting to find in the true dark laminite beds some fish remains. We are looking to the tender tables, a swimming shelter for young Arcadians in the 1950s and 60s. And between this location and there is three fish beds. And we can call these laminites fish beds because we now start seeing fish scales in each of the laminites. And in fact, Lake Ten by the tender tables is where Hugh Miller found his fossil nail, so-called Anastolithus, which is depicted in Strumnus Museum. <laughs> 